Hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for your patience. We just wanted to make sure everybody got here. And I guess it's not raining yet, which is very good. Um, so I'm Judy Greenspan, Director of Public Programs here at the Center for Jewish History. And on behalf of the Center and our co-sponsor tonight, the Jewish Book Council, I am really delighted to welcome you to our program, Margalee Fox, in conversation with Ruth Franklin. It's a program I've been looking forward to for quite a while now. The program this evening is part of our series, which we call First Person, a series inspired by really a love of history and great storytelling and the connection between both of them. David McCullough says it better than I did, so I'm going to quote him. He said, history is about people, it's about life, it's about cause and effect, it's about stories. So First Person is just that, a series of personal stories each illuminating an aspect of the Jewish experience and together revealing the richness of Jewish history. Here at the Center for Jewish History, the series is part of our mission, <clears throat> excuse me, part of our mission to preserve and remember the past and to use that knowledge to better understand the present. So before I introduce Margalit and Ruth, a few words about where we are today. Are there any people in the audience who have never been here before? Ah, okay. Well, that's very nice. All right, good. So, for those of you, and a little refresher for the rest of you, the Center for Jewish History is a world-renowned research institution. It's a destination for public programs, concerts, exhibitions, a place to explore your family tree. And most importantly, the Center is home to our five partner organizations and their extraordinary archives. Our partners, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, the Leo Beck Institute, Yeshiva University Museum, and the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research together possess a treasure trove of historical artifacts, documents, artworks, and photos that make up the largest repository of Jewish archival material outside of Israel, and that is right here on West 16th Street. Our partners' combined collections include five miles of archival materials, 50,000 digitized photographs, 500,000 books in a variety of languages, and span hundreds of years of history. Best of all, these collections are not meant to be hidden away. You can spend hours on the online collections looking through uh, everything that has been digitized, and any member of the public is welcome to visit our reading room where our librarians are available to help you dig into these wonderful resources. So Margalit Fox knows all about the treasures an archive can reveal. Her new book, Conan Doyle for the Defense, The True Story of a Sensational British Murder, A Quest for Justice, and the World's Most Famous Detective Writer, is the result of extensive archival research in Scotland. Margalit will discuss her adventures in the archives with Ruth Franklin, the stories she uncovered that are in her book and her illustrious career writing obituaries for the New York Times. So I imagine most of us here have been familiar with Marguerite's byline for quite a while. A uh, show of hands for those of you who have enjoyed, yes, I mean, oh yes, everybody, there we go. Um, Marguerite originally trained as a cellist and a linguist, and she worked for the Times for 24 years, 14 of those as a member of the celebrated New York Times obituary department. An award-winning writer, Marguerite wrote an astounding 1,400 obituaries during her career, beautifully crafted biographies, and many written under what could only be, considering, could only be considered excruciating deadline pressure. So I must ask how many people here saw the documentary Obit? Yes, again. And so in 2016, Marguerite was one of the writers featured in the wonderful documentary Obit, directed by Vanessa Gould, who may be here tonight. Are you? Maybe not yet. OK. Um, the documentary offered a terrific behind the bylines look at the New York Times obituary department. And as one critic wrote, one comes away from the film grateful that the paper has at its disposal a team of humane, gifted people who make commemorating the dead a lively, lasting art. During her career, Marguerite wrote front page send-offs to some of the leading cultural figures of our era, including Betty Friedan, 
the, Maya, uh, the writer Maya Angelou, the advice co columnist Dear Abby and Ann Landers, as well as many obits of many people whose names you might not have known, like the inventor of the plastic lawn flamingo. So does anyone here know who that was? Anyone remember? Yes? Oh. Right, so that was Don Featherstone, which I learned from reading uh, her obituaries. So not surprisingly, many of the people Marguerite wrote about also have a place in the collections here at the Center for Jewish History. Advertising copywriter Judith Protus is one of those. From her largely anonymous pen sprang a slogan esteemed to this day for its warmth, wit, and genial inclusiveness, Marguerite wrote when Miss Protus died in 2014. And if you don't remember her name or recognize her name, I, oops, that's not it. Hey, what happened? I'm sure you will remember this ad. <laughs> um, her blockbuster ad campaign, and that vintage poster is here in our collections of the Yeshiva University Museum. So, when Margalit announced her retirement on June 28th of this year, she received an outpouring of thanks and online comments from her readers, which I enjoyed reading very much, a couple of them here. I have truly, truly enjoyed your words these many years. They have been a gift and a noble calling. Another person wrote, so grateful to Marguerite Fox, not only for your beautifully written obituaries, but also for providing the inspiration for our daughter's name. And this one, I think, is really quite good. I'd always pictured you to be tall, old, and snobby. Go figure, your picture shows you to be not so tall, definitely not old, and not snobby. I may have been wrong about my vision, but I'm not wrong about how wonderful your work has been. Whenever I found myself reading one of your obits, I knew it was going to be a treat. So to have the opportunity tonight to bring together two such impressive writers is also a treat, and we're thrilled that Ruth Franklin will be on stage tonight with Margalit. Ruth, whose numerous credentials are, more list are listed more completely in your program, is a book critic and former editor at The New Republic. Her work appears in many publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times Book Review, The New York Review of Books, and Harper's. Her first biography, Shirley Jackson, A Rather Haunted Life, was named a New York Times Notable Book of 2016, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography, and was named a New York, oh, I'm sorry, among many other honors. I have a typo. Her first book, A Thousand Darknesses, Lies in Truth and Holocaust fic uh, Fiction, was published in 2011 and was a finalist for the Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature. So a final note, tonight's conversation will include questions and answers from the audience, and there will be a book signing and small reception right outside the auditorium when we finish. So with no further ado, I welcome Marguerite Fox and Ruth Franklin. Good evening. It's so nice to be not tall, old, or snobby. <laughs> and thank you, Judy. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you all so much for coming out on this rather raw evening, which is very representative of the weather in a place where I have spent a lot of time. So I'd like you to come with me to the scene of a murder in Edwardian, Glasgow. And the trial and wrongful conviction of a Jewish man in Edinburgh nearby for that murder. But first, I want to take you 200 miles north to Peterhead, a raw place, the northernmost point on Scotland's east coast. For it was there that our hero, Oscar Slater, spent nearly 20 years incarcerated for a crime he didn't commit. And it is there, in the winter of 1925, that our story begins. I'd like to read to you the prologue of Conan Doyle for the Defense. It is entitled Prisoner 2988. On January 23, 1925, William Gordon, lately known as Prisoner 2988, was released from His Majesty's prison, Peter Head, a Victorian fortress on Scotland's raw northeast coast. Gordon would very likely have passed into history unremarked 
except for his possession, possession of a vital anatomical feature. He wore dentures. Now, beneath his dentures that day, furled into a tiny pellet with a scrap of glazed paper rolled round it to keep it dry, Gordon carried an urgent note from a fellow convict. Though prison officials had made a thorough search of Gordon before releasing him, no one thought to examine his gums. And so the message, which would culminate in the release nearly three years later of Oscar Slater from a life at hard labor, was spirited into the world. Where earlier efforts to free Slater had been made by lawyers, this last desperate stratagem was set in motion by Slater himself. He had slipped Gordon the note, written in pencil on a fragment of brown tissue paper during a meeting of the prison debating society. A clandestine pellet like this was the safest means of communication between them. Like most British prisons of its era, Peterhead maintained a regimen of enforced silence. Prisoners, supervised around the clock by armed guards, were allowed to speak to one another only in direct connection with their work. By 1925, Slater had already been disciplined for talking to a fellow convict through a ventilator between cells. Slater's message, now fragile and faded, has been preserved in the archives of the Mitchell Library in Glasgow. And that is it. I've held it. Bearing many of the hallmarks of his idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic spelling, punctuation, and syntax, it reads, Gordon, my boy, I wish you in every way the best of luck. And if you feel inclined, then please do what you can for me. Give to the English public your opinion regarding me personally and also in other respects. You have been for five years in close contact with me, and so you are quite fit to do so. Friend, keep out of prison, but especially out of this godforsaken hole. Farewell, Gordon. We likely may never see us again, but let us live in hope that it may be otherwise. Your friend, Oscar Slater. And then, P.S. Don't forget to write or see Conan D. That Gordon carried out Slater's instructions can be gleaned from a second communication, an anonymous letter that reached Peter Head in mid-February. Addressed to Slater, it said, just a few lines to try to cheer you up. You have staunch friends in the outside world who are doing their utmost for you so you must not lose heart. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle bids me say that you have all his sympathy and all the weight of his interest will be put in the scale on your behalf. We should like to get a line from you if you are allowed to write. In the meantime, keep up your heart and hope for the best and rest assured we are doing our utmost for you. Now the letter which prison officials strongly suspected came from Gordon was suppressed on arrival. But though Slater did not know it, his anxious note had accomplished its purpose. It persuaded Conan Doyle, who had long sought, with immense energy but disheartening results, to commute his sentence to take up the case one last time. Now, the crime for which Oscar Slater had barely escaped the hangman's noose was, in the words of a late 20th century writer, a case of murder which has frequently been described as without parallel in criminal history. It was stunningly violent. Its victim, Marion Gilchrist, was refined, wealthy, and more than slightly eccentric. Under great pressure to solve the case, the police soon announced that they had a suspect, 36-year-old Oscar Slater who had arrived in Glasgow that year with his young French mistress, nominally a music hall singer, but quite probably a prostitute. Now, in the eyes of Edwardian Glasgow, 
Oscar Slater was in every way a desirable culprit. He was a foreigner, a native of Germany, and a Jew. His dandified demimond life affronted the sensibilities of the age. Slater billed himself variously as a dentist and a dealer in precious stones, that's his actual business card, but was believed to earn his living as a gambler. Even before the murder, the Glasgow police had been monitoring him in the hope of having him arrested as a pimp, as I found to my delight in the decorous diction of the age the charge they sought to press was immoral housekeeping. <laughs> I've been guilty of that myself. <laughs> Slater's trial took place in Edinburgh in May 1909, and there he is, conspicuously in the dock between two uniformed cops, with the case against him founded on circumstantial evidence and outright fabrication. Circumstantial evidence, Conan Doyle wrote, is a very tricky thing. It may seem to point a very straight to one thing, but if you shift your own point of view a little, you may find it pointing in an equally uncompromising manner to something entirely different. Now, those words are Sherlock Holmes's spoken in an 1891 story, The Boscombe Valley Affair. They stand as a precise augury of the Slater case. The Slater jury deliberated for just 70 minutes before finding him guilty, and the judge sentenced him to hang. This is a period scribal copy of his death warrant. Hang by the neck upon a gibbet until he be dead. It couldn't be more stark. The pronouncement had a terrible finality. There was no criminal appeals court in Scotland at the time. Pardons, when they were occasionally granted, were by prerogative of the British monarch. By the time, nearly three weeks later, that Slater's sentence was commuted to life at hard labor, he had made arrangements for his own burial. Transported to Peterhead, he paced his tiny cell, hewed granite, and railed at his jailers for much of the next two decades. That is an actual Peter head cell. A man can barely stretch out in that. In late 1911 or early 1912, Slater's lawyers asked Conan Doyle to lend his support to their cause. Though he deplored Slater's ungentlemanly life, Conan Doyle, a Scotsman himself, soon came to believe that the case was a stain on the British character. He trained his diagnostic eye on every aspect of the crime, manhunt, and trial, wrote the case of Oscar Slater, his scathing 1912 indictment of the affair, penned a stream of letters to British newspapers, edited, published, and contributed a trenchant introduction to The Truth About Oscar Slater, the 1927 book by the journalist William Park, and lobbied some of the most powerful officials in Britain. The reprieve came at last in November 1927. In 1928, after a criminal appeals court was established in Scotland, a development brought about partly through Conan Doyle's agitation, Slater's trial was reviewed and his conviction quashed. The hearing, which Conan Doyle covered for a British newspaper, marked the only time in their long association that he and Slater met face to face. Then, after the triumphant resolution, came a bitter, highly public rupture. Now, these developments form the long, painful sequel to an exceptionally strange event that occurred in Glasgow in December 1908, about a week before the death of Marion Gilchrist. More than a week, in other words, before Oscar Slater even knew of her existence. Though the fact would not be widely known for years, Miss Gilchrist told at least one person that week 
that she knew she was going to be murdered. There we are. Thank you. Stories, <laughs> but it seems. Okay, um, as I was saying, you can see from this introduction that Margalit has such a flair for storytelling. Um, this story seems like it really just begs to be told. It's got, you know, it's got everything. It's got the wrongful conviction. It's got the foreigner with the shady past. It's got Arthur Conan Doyle. I know there's a story in how you came to this story. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Of course, I make no claim to have discovered it. The story is in the historical record. It was always there. It's been there for exactly 110 years. And every Conan Doyle biography, uh, there are dozens, has anywhere from a paragraph on the case to a chapter. But in this country, to my amazement, there are no standalone books just on the Oscar Slater case. And there are very few, even in Britain, uh, on the case. <laughs> I feel like Ouija listening to the police scanner. A live mic, right? Is that what it's called? Um, right. right, we know what that did to uh, the Durst case, a live mic. Um, so be very careful. Um, but uh, to my amazement, it's the Oscar Slater story, over time, for various reasons, which I can conjecture, slipped into a crevice in history, and those happen to be the kind of stories I like best. I came to it literally 30 years ago when I had first come to New York after graduate school. I had a rather uninspiring entry-level job in publishing, was riding the A-train to work one morning, and the book I happened to have brought with me to read on the train was John Dixon Carr's biography of Conan Doyle. That was published in 1949, just 19 years after Conan Doyle died. And toward the end of the book, almost just in an offhand way, John Dixon Carr says, oh, by the way, Sir Arthur also used the methods of his most famous character to investigate and overturn the wrongful conviction of a poor immigrant man for murder. I almost dropped the book. Conan Doyle was playing Sherlock Holmes himself. Why wasn't this better known? But I was scarcely in a position to do anything about it yet. I had not gone into writing. I hadn't uh, gone to journalism school yet. So I filed the story away in that cranial recess that Holmes so wonderfully calls the brain attic. And there it stayed for 30 years. Uh, six years ago when my last book, The Riddle of the Labyrinth, came out and I was casting around for what to do next, I remembered the Oscar Slater story. By that time I was a senior writer at the Times. I'd written a couple of nonfiction books and I thought, all right, now I'm in a position to do something about it. And so were you a Conan Doyle fan? How did you just happen to be carrying around this 1949 biography? I was not a Conan Doyle completist or a Conan Doyle freak, and I mean freak in the nicest possible way. Uh, I'm not someone who can recite chapter and verse of every story in the canon, although of course I read the entire canon to prepare for this book. Um, but Conan Doyle was always fascinating to me. My father was a physicist and a mathematician, and so of course I didn't hew to that professionally, but he taught me how to think rationally and how to look at evidence and see if it militates for this conclusion or that conclusion. So of course he loved uh, writers like Conan Doyle. He loved writers like Lewis Carroll where you could see that rationalist, clever mathematical mind at work. And so uh, it seemed, even in the 1980s, it seemed eminently reasonable to take a Conan Doyle bio to read on the A-train on the way to work. 
And it's interesting that you say that about your father. I think that's something that your book does so well, is not just telling this very um, you know, exciting and twisty story of Oscar Slater's um, conviction and the, the, the way it was overturned, but also the way you fill in so many of the historical pieces that give context to why this happened and how Conan Doyle was the perfect person to uncover it. The way you talk about the history of criminology and um, it's not, it's not deductive reasoning. You, you correct us on that. Right, it's inductive or better still, abductive. abductive even though Conan Doyle himself makes that mistake repeatedly. Yeah. So how did you, tell us a little bit about the process of putting the book together. How did you kind of pull together all these different strands? It was excruciating. <laughs> um, and in fact, the, the little slide that you got a sneak peek of, in 2014, the principal archives for this material are in two places, in Glasgow where the crime was committed and then in Edinburgh where they had a change of venue for the trial because the nation's highest court is there. And so in 2014, I, I spent a week in archives in each city and of course you can't just walk in, say I want X, Y, and Z and walk out with it, you have to fill out endless forms giving chapter and verse of the accession numbers and then I taxed their poor reprographic departments to death because I ordered literally, I had to, thousands of pages of materials from each place. Um, so you're not allowed, this is the sort of place where you're not allowed to go in with your camera and do your own digital images? You can do a little, but they, uh, they wouldn't have worked for me to really study from. The image quality would not have been good enough or big enough. And be, there are literally um, period, you know, um, stenographic trial transcripts on paper this big, copies of Marion Gilchrist's will and testament, uh, witness statements, uh, police reports, class formerly classified government documents, you name it, uh, between the Mitchell Library in Glasgow and National Records of Scotland, both super archives uh, in, in Edinburgh, I wound up about six months later having this many jiffy bags come, and it took me a year and a half to go through everything. I was also working full time, and then I also did a lot of reading just from good old fashioned books. So um, I took those pictures either to make myself feel virtuous or to feel really, really sorry for myself. It, it, I'm not quite sure which. And so, as always with a big project, the the rigor and the challenge and the hysteria, the despair sometimes, but also the exhilaration comes from what you leave out, because I'm sure I had to leave out 90% of what I found just for reasons of sheer volume. And another writer, or I myself on a different day, could approach the material, write a completely different book from the same sources, equally comprehensive and equally legitimate. Yes, and, and of course you could have written a book twice this size easily, it sounds like. Uh, what was the most surprising thing you found in that archive? I think the most beautiful thing, and the thing I'm really proudest of because they were available to the few other British writers on the case, but who for one reason or another didn't make much use of them, the great beauty for a biographer, for a nonfiction writer, if you have to write about someone, write about someone who's been incarcerated in a very restrictive prison because they will have kept on file every single letter that person sent and received, in this case in 18 and a half years. And so there are literally bulging files at National Records of Scotland from Peterhead Prison of every single one of Oscar Slater's letters. And Slater, poor man, was in a sense shafted twice by history. First by being the object of this terrible wrongful conviction, a conviction, by the way, uh, for a crime of which police knew within a week that he was not guilty, but because he was an immigrant Jew that they wanted to run out of town, they went ahead with the prosecution anyway and were perfectly happy to railroad him almost to the gallows. Um, but he was shafted once by the wrongful conviction, and the second time by being as I say, a cipher at the center of his own story. He was almost written out of his own history. So in the few other published accounts of the case, 
he is just, as he was at the time, sort of a bogeyman, an, an evil archetype and not much more. But in these beautiful, beautiful letters, which I could only quote a fragment of, he comes alive. He's incarcerated so long that he winds up corresponding with three generations of his family, uh, poor German Jews back in Silesia. His father was a baker. They're in this dusty little coal mining town that he came from nothing. But there are these extraordinary letters from his mother saying, my dear innocent Oscar, a thousand kisses from your mother who loves you with her last breath. And then you see, because so much time goes by, the parents aging, and suddenly they're not there anymore. You see then Oscar Slater's sisters take over writing the letters, and he's in prison so long you then see letters from the sisters' children. And so I am, was so moved by those, I wish I could have included more, but they give a sense of the man and of the, the, the Jewish family milieu. Yeah, and it's so it's so touching that the family passed down through generations this this obligation to keep up contact with Oscar Slater in prison, and so impressive also that they they don't ever seem to have questioned that he was innocent, which I also found really really moving to read. It is letters. moving, and of course I suppose that's part of the Jewish condition, isn't it? That you know that somebody is going to make all sorts of horrible false allegations against you. And yeah, their faith in him never wavered. And it's heart, they were very poor. And so there are heartrending letters from the parents saying, you know, we are trying to find a lawyer to help you, but we can't afford it. We would love to come visit you, but we can't afford passage. And for the 18 and a half years Slater was in prison from 1909 until he got out at the end of 1927. He did not see a single member of his family, even once. Yeah, it's really, really heartbreaking. And I, I was, I was fascinated by the way you, you draw out the Jewish element of his story without, without making too more, making more of it than, than it is, but kind of restoring to it um, what was erased from it clearly by the other biographers. And you know, one thing I also found so fascinating was the way you place it in the context of the prejudices of his time. You have this wonderful phrase where you say that, that he was cast by the police, he was cast as the convenient other. And it really makes you think about the way, um, you know, these tropes of otherness, you know, the stranger and the emigrant, you know, in many ways have evolved since Oscar Slater's time, and in other ways, not so much, right? Sous ça change. As I said, uh, say in the introduction to the book, Little did I realize when I started work on this material in 2013 that this story that was all about racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and aggressive efforts to put tight restrictions on immigration, little, little did I realize how painfully realized it would, relevant it would be to our own moment. Um, Oscar Slater, it's interesting. I mean, we don't, in a sense, we don't know much about him because had it not been for this, he would have been just a guy, you know, an ordinary European Jewish working class guy that probably didn't make a ripple in history. But he clearly had a sense of Jewish identity, and that you can see that from the letters. There was a circuit riding rabbi from Aberdeen that would come up occasionally, but not often enough. He has these beautiful letters that say, I feel so downcast and spiritually neglected. I have not had a Jewish service for two years. Uh, a later letter, he says, for 17 years, I have been in the only Jew in this prison. And there's an extraordinary line in a letter where he's writing to one, um, a rabbi in Glasgow, who was his great supporter. Let me see if I can find it. Look at that. That's from Oscar Slater's own hand. Lishana Tova Tikatevo. So I don't know whether he was copying from something or he had some Hebrew education as a boy. There's no way to know. But um, the sense of Jewishness and the sense of being othered in uh, Edwardian and post Edwardian Britain comes through loud and clear in his correspondence. And I think that's also 
something that makes Conan Doyle kind of jump out of your pages as such a hero is the way he really is, um, you know, a, a crusader against the prejudices of his time. You you talk a lot about the construction of the criminal identity as being, you know, the the theory from which the accusations followed rather than the reverse. And then he comes in as sort of the bearer of scientific evidence and actually looking at all the details and putting together the, the picture as it actually is. What's so interesting is we, and I was very guilty of this when I went in, to us, Conan Doyle has become uh, this received archetype. And you know we think of him as, as uh, Basil Rathbone or later Jeremy Brett. But we think of him as this clubbable London gentleman. And he wasn't at all. He, Remarkably, his background had weird affinities with Slater's. They were both dirt poor, marginalized for their religion. Conan Doyle was Roman Catholic, and uh, neither was an Englishman. Conan Doyle grew up very poor in Edinburgh, uh, the de facto head of a family with seven children. His father was a mentally ill alcoholic who couldn't work. Uh, he came from nothing. And to his credit, although he was mostly the best, but in some ways the worst of kind of Victorian imperialism, he never entirely forgot where he came from. And he, although he's not as well remembered for this today, in his heyday, he was as well known for social crusades as he was for his Sherlock Holmes books. So as everybody here, I'm sure, knows from reading your writing, you are no stranger to writing about long dead people who you weren't able to meet and bring them to life, which is a little bit different from the work of most journalists, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about you know, the connection between obituary writing and the kind of nonfiction that you're, you've come to be doing now? Well, with Obits, of course, uh, ideally, it's recently dead people, otherwise we have <laughs> falling down on the job, but indeed, uh, there really is quite an affinity between the two. What we are so proud, I still say we, what we are still so proud of doing at the Times is producing obits that don't read like the obits of old. But they do all the work of an obit in terms of news value and conveying information, but they read like good narrative nonfiction. And what is a narrative nonfiction book then that kind of a nonfiction news story structurally gridded up a hundredfold because the whole structure of a book is there in the thousand word news story in kernel form. Uh, and if you want to turn that into a hundred thousand word book, you just keep gridding up and gridding up and gridding up. And what's so great about Obits and why it really is, the dirty little secret is it's the best beat in journalism is an Ovid writer is taxed with taking her subject from cradle to grave. There's that boilerplate language. You know, John Doe was born on January 1st, 1910. John Doe died yesterday. And between those two points, you have this wonderful built-in narrative arc. And it's such a wonderful, exhilarating beat because one is, it is the most purely narrative thing in any daily paper. And so having done that for a number of years already, before I began to, uh, to write books, I think it was, I never would have predicted it, but it was the best possible preparation I could have for reasons of, of structure and form. How did you first come to start writing of it? Well, as I often say, the child has not been born who comes home from first grade clutching a theme that says, when I grow up, I want to be an obituary writer. Uh, I came through it through the back door, as I seem to have done uh, at every stage of my career. I was a copy editor at the time, Sunday Book Review, for my first 10 years at the paper. And while it was a lovely job, I really had wanted to write. By that time, I had gotten a journalism degree and trained for a writing career, which I'd hoped to have. I began writing advance obits freelance, because there is always a need. There's this gaping maw. That, uh, that's in the lap of the gods that needs to be fed advance obits. 
And so when a staff job on Obits opened up uh, quite a number of years later, I applied for it and was lucky enough to get it because I had a track record. So I, I wrote my way onto Obits because historically it's the job nobody wanted, even though it turns out to be a great job. Why is it, why is it the job nobody wanted? Just because it's sexier to cover politics? Or? Well, that, I think there are a number of reasons. I think there's a kind of tr primal taboo of avoiding anything that has to do with death, even though, as all of you who read our page know, the death is one sentence and the whole rest of it is about the life. But still, there's that kind of taboo and stigma that attached. And also, until this generation in American newspapers, obits were a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Because of the taboo, because of the stigma, newspapers tended to put the dead wood on obits. They would put people on obits to punish them. They would put people on obits whom they were trying to encourage to retire, or at least put out to pasture. And so, of course, the writing that those not so great people produced was not so great. So it was this endlessly self-perpetuating cycle. And for a very long time, obits on most American papers weren't particularly good. And yet, you know, so many people say that it's the first section of the paper yes. that they turn to in the morning, right? That's right, which I think comes from a kind of primal schadenfreude. Again, it, it's the still, secular still here. right. It's the secular counterpart to the prayer that observant Jews say, you know, thank you for <laughs> letting me live to see another day. I absolutely believe that. <laughs> now let now let me see who didn't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that um, many journalists also probably have some kind of hesitation about calling up grieving families, right, and wanting to check the facts. How how did you get over any reluctance you might imagine? Well, you get over any reluctance because you have no choice. But the reluctance is, is natural and it's inherent because there's no Emily Post for the truly bizarre social situation, which is reducible to, hello, I'm a stranger. I'm cold calling you. You don't know me from Adam. But I want to ask you some possibly delicate questions about a loved one who has just drop dead, and then I'm going to put them where a million people can see them. That's a very preposterous situation. Uh, so it has to be done delicately. I will say, for better or worse, you know, the power of the times, in 1,400 obits I've done, we, where there is family, we call the family for each one. In all that time, I think I've had three families refuse to speak to me. So those odds I'll take. Do you, did you have certain questions that you always asked, or did you change it for each specific person? Uh, both. There is, we actually have a form, because there's sort of basic biographical boilerplate that the families are best positioned. Um, and you know, really elemental things, name, middle name, date of birth, parents' names, where was he born. And we have learned through bitter experience that supposedly definitive print sources like the who's who are just rife with errors, and it can, you know, if it's one letter off in a name or one year off in a date, a miss is as good as a mile, and you're going to have to run a correction. So we go to the families to, to uh, solicit or confirm that information. And then, of course, there are more particular questions that we can ask of families, of colleagues, of other experts in the field, depending on what it is this person has been famous for in life. I know you've said um, that the obit section is the jolliest section of the paper. Why, why is that? Well, I'll show you. Since the, all of these slides are about Slater, I thought I'd better put in one about obits. So the last one, this is the prison. That is Slater's actual cell, number 34. Uh, that's my umbrella after 20 minutes up in Peterhead. And he spent, <laughs> he spent 18 and a half years outside breaking up granite. But here is, ah. Uh, all right, this for this audience, this is the treat. Um, this was the Time Magazine review of Conan Doyle for the Defense, and I was very, very pleased with it. But the layout is not to be believed that this book that is so essentially about anti-Semitism and Jewish identity was laid out next to a giant ad for bacon. <laughs> <laughs> But here's, uh, now we're getting to Obits. <laughs> That's our departmental Christmas display from last year. Does that say Rest in Pieces? Yeah, that's a book. Um, 
that's our, our voluminous shrine. Um, it just really, really wonderful people have landed there, partly uh, by historical happenstance, partly by contemporary hiring choices. And um, the work, as Ruth alluded to, the work of reporting obits is not like any other thing. So for the, my 14 years there, I actually kept a semi-covert list of the unusual things that people say, because we could all hear one another, in the line of duty. And my favorite, because it's very much like a Jewish joke, is my wonderful colleague, Doug Martin, whose byline you will know, was calling someone. And he said, deadly serious, so did her friends know she was a spy? Or was it something she kind of kept to herself? <laughs> <laughs> and you can't put a price on that. It's just absolutely delightful. So. <laughs> One thing we've seen happening in the paper recently is these um, retrospective obits, for lack of a better word, of people who didn't get one the first time around, mainly for political reasons. Can you talk a little bit about the, the thinking that went into that, um, that the, this drive to kind of correct the omissions of the past? Amy, if you're here, you know what's about to happen. Amy, are you here? No, I was hoping my wonderful colleague, Amy Padnani, whose brainchild the Overlooked series is, uh, would be here tonight, and then I would make her stand up and put her on the spot. Amy, stand up. <laughs> would you mind? Uh, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, and Amy can talk about it much better than I can. I've, I've contributed only one piece to it uh, on the first American women's Olympic champion who didn't even realize she'd won the Olympics, which is kind of a strange state of affairs. Thank you, Amy. I should have warned you I was going to do this to you. <laughs> but this brilliant series is Amy's brainchild. And so do you want to talk for a second about how it came about? Sure, well, I joined OBITS only about two years ago, and um, at that time, I was really curious about diversity and how we could incorporate it more into our coverage, and we occasionally had these emails from readers saying, hey, why don't you have more women and people of color in your pages? And I thought, yeah, why don't we? And so I just sort of tucked this in the corner of my mind, and one day for our typical day-to-day -day OBITS research, I came across a woman named Mary Outerbridge. She was credited with introducing tennis to America in 1874 on Staten Island of all places. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting. I wonder if she ever got an obit when she died in 1889. And so I checked the Times Machine archives. If you've never been, it's a wonderful place to explore. You get lost in it easily. So I checked to see if she got a New York Times obit, and spoiler alert, she did not. So. Um, so I sort of took that away in the corner of my mind and then started coming across more and more interesting people whose histories I would check in the archives of the Times. Um, I told Margo about this project and she had some ideas of her own um, along with some other colleagues who said, ooh, did this person get an obit? Did that person get an obit? And so soon I had this long list and I thought we have something here. You know, maybe if you look back to 1851 when the New York Times began publishing, we can finally tell these stories. And it's a powerful time as any. So that's kind of how it came about. Well, thank you for answering my question so thoroughly. <laughs> I'm going to just sit back and let you guys talk. <laughs> um, so I can't help thinking in the context of this book, have you ever written the obit for a criminal? Yes. Uh, I did Charles Manson's obit, which okay. ran, yeah. That was done in advance, and it's interesting because uh, still in, in regional papers and small town papers, obits are a very different animal, and they have a very different social function, partly because of staffing and budget restrictions. Very few, even big papers, have obit departments anymore. So in a local paper, what is set in type and called an obit is usually just straight from the family or from the funeral home. And so it's a journalistic in that sense. It, it 
basically represents their interests and it tells people where to pay a condolence call and so on. But that has kind of, that brush sort of tars all over it. And so we often get people, very well-meaning, who say, oh, you wrote such a lovely tribute for so-and-so. And we kind of bristle a little bit and we say, thank you, but they're not tributes. They're news stories. And by way of example, we've done Holocaust uh, war criminals. We've done enforcers of segregation in the Jim Crow South. I did Sheriff Jim Clark. Um, we do notorious murderers. I did um, Manson. I did the um, crazy, misguided hippie guy who uh, killed someone blowing up the Army Mathematics Research Center at the University of Wisconsin during the Vietnam War. And they have to be done, and they have to be done right. But believe me, when you're doing one of these unpalatable people, it makes your blood run cold, and you want to just go home and wash them off you. And is it the same thing where you contact their family and say, can you share your memories of your dear departed dad? I wasn't going to contact Manson's family. <laughs> you can, though. I mean, in all seriousness, you can if there is family. It's very, very rare in that case that such a family will talk to you, or even that such a family can be found because if they're sort of, you know, upright people, they've probably changed their names and, and disappeared into the seething mass of American anonymity long ago. But you check it any way you can. You can involve your uh, research department. You work public records. And so the same, you have to have the same kind of fealty to historical fact and the same kind of fealty to checking. It may be more difficult because um, no, fa no family has presented itself. Here, a little bit of gallows humor. One of my colleagues um, did just a little item on a, a mass murderer, a guy named Arthur Shawcross, who was kind of notorious in the day. And when he filed the story, our section head, Bill McDonald, who was reading it down, said, I hesitate to ask you this, he said to the reporter, but are there any survivors? <laughs> so <laughs> all that stuff still has to be in there one way or another. You know. Um Maybe you already were an expert on the Scottish penal system, for all I know. But looking at some of the slides you showed, it reminded me, I was really shocked to see the way the, the conditions in the prison that you documented. It really was like a penal colony. Yeah, and it was, not, it was in its way, slightly progressive. The uh, Peterhead, His Majesty's Prison, Peterhead, uh, or Her Majesty's Prison, when it was uh, built, it was built in 1888, was this Victorian fortress, you know, in the middle of nowhere on this windswept promontory on the North Sea. And um, it operated as a prison until 2013, and what had long since acquired the reputation as one of the most brutal and dangerous prisons in Britain. It was called Scotland's Gulag. Uh, it is now, strange as it sounds, a museum. And I actually commend you to go there. Uh, first of all, let me see if I can back this up enough. You make the weather look so nice. Um, <laughs> this is the country on the way to it. It's the most beautiful country in the world, up in Aberdeenshire. You have to take the train to Inverness, and then it's so far north the train doesn't go to Peterhead. You take a, a bus. It's about an hour and a half through this gorgeous country. And it is this absolutely fascinating museum. They're completely upfront about what a terrible prison it was and all of the horrible riots and privations and things that happened there, uh, really interesting exhibits. You can stand in Oscar Slater's cell. And what is so interesting is I thought, who's going to go to this? They've had something like 90,000 visitors in their first year of operations. And I pictured dads and their teenage sons out for a nice Sunday at the prison. But after I toured all of the cells with the you know stage blood exhibit splattered, I went to the cafe, and there are these proper little Scottish ladies in nice hats having tea. So everyone go, it's the Peterhead Prison Museum, and if you do go to Scotland, I, I'm not kidding, it's actually worth a trip. I mean, people go to Alcatraz, yeah. right? Why not, uh, why not try the prison? Right. So I just, I have one last question. I think we're running towards the end of our allotment, and then maybe we'll have time for a couple questions from the audience. But um, do you know what happened to Oscar Slater's family during World War II? 
it's in the book and it'll tear your heart out. That's that's all I can say. But I'm I'm in a painful way very proud because mine is the only account that as far as I know uh, took the trouble to find out what happened to his family. And what I will say is Oscar Slater uh, when he got out of Peter Head, he couldn't go home. He, in those years anyway, a German who had lived outside the country for more than 10 years lost his German citizenship. He'd been outside for almost 20 years. So he was, in effect, a man without a country. He wound up settling in Scotland and remarrying happily. He lived, he died in his bed in his 70s in 1948, having outlived almost all of the principles in the case against him. In a very strange way, had this case not kept him out of Germany for so long, he might well not have lived as long as he did. Questions? Right here. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, You're front and center. <laughs> no. Why? Why did he go from Germany? How? What were his stops along the way to Scotland? And what was the murder? Ah, uh, well, all of this is in the book. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was just a footloose young man. There are some theories he uh, quit Germany to avoid conscription in the army. But just like a lot of working class young men, he didn't want to work in an office. He tried it for a while, didn't like it. And he went all over. He lived in London for a while. He lived in New York for a while. He lived in Scotland a couple of times. Um, Conan Doyle, interestingly, called him a disreputable rolling stone of a man. And indeed, he was a rolling stone. So there is Conan Doyle's Victorian distaste. But what is so admirable about Conan Doyle is he was such a principled person that considerations of justice and fair play trumped, you should pardon the expression, his <laughs> personal antipathy. I love audiobooks. Uh, how's the audiobook? Oh, hi. Thank you for asking about the audiobook. I'm really proud of the audiobook because I suggested they get a Scottish reader, which they did. It's a Scottish voice actor, and it is absolutely super. And he does all the accents, just you know, subtly, but he makes uh, Slater sound slightly German. And Conan Doyle, Conan Doyle, to the end of his life, though he lived the last 40 years of his life in England, never he had a Scottish bird you could cut with a knife. So your homework when you go home is go on YouTube and Google uh, Conan Doyle 1927 newsreel. And there are these, it's three years before he died, and he has this accent that you can cook with a knife. Even It's so great, and it's so antithetical to our concept of him as this English gentleman. Thank you. Right in the middle there. Oh. Thank you so Thank you so much for the book. I have a question about Charteris, Mr. Charteris. Ah, well, that may involve a spoiler. We, there is a no. family tree in the book. Uh, the, in brief, the, mur the murder victim was a very eccentric, wealthy 82-year-old woman named Marion Gilchrist who lived in Glasgow, kept what would be the equivalent now of a court, about half a million dollars of jewelry secreted in her flat. And the way they got onto Oscar Slater, it, it's just a devastating coincidence. After she was murdered, her maid testified that the only piece that was missing was a diamond brooch in the shape of a crescent moon. And woe betide Oscar Slater, he had pawned a diamond crescent moon brooch right around that time. And even though the police knew within a week that his brooch was not the one of the murdered woman, they said, this guy, we want to get this guy off our streets anyway. This is too good to be true. Let's get him. And they did. Um, so I'm always so impressed with the speed that obituaries come out of famous people who die suddenly. I mean, I understand if somebody is sick that you would prepare it. So what is the threshold of celebrity done where you start free writing their obit? Well, it's, uh, there's no one hard and fast rule. It's done on a case-by-case -case basis. But what we can say with confidence is if you're the president or the king or queen of something, we probably have you on file. Ditto 
you know, politicians on a, on a certain level, old time Hollywood silver screen stars, that sort of thing. That said, of course, sometimes we, there are gaps in the record, and um, even big figures, uh, Seamus Heaney, I wrote on deadline, Adrian Rich, I wrote on deadline, not because they, we haven't thought they were important, but just because our department is small and the work of accounting for all of the newsworthy undead is Sisyphean. So um, we do the best we can in terms of advances. We have about 1,900 on file, but the rest is in the lap of the gods. I love what you said in your Paris Review interview, by the way, about how I think your editor or your predecessor would uh, use the euphemism of updating the biographical file. Right, that was when the great. Talking to people who are still alive. The great Alden Whitman, and I use that a lot because it's as awkward as it is to call families of someone who's died. Imagine the thousandfold more awkward situation of calling someone who is not dead and, in effect, saying, "I'm a circling vulture. I know you're going to be gone soon." <laughs> Uh, and so the one, the great mid-century times man, Obit, uh, Alden Whitman, had this wonderful euphemism. This is Whitman from the Times. We're updating your biographical file. And people can take on as much as they can handle. Although I said that to a woman uh, who invented something really cool that I can't tell you what it is, um, that shaped mid-century American culture. And she's well into her 90s. And so I thought I want to be delicate. I said, this is Fox of the Times, we're updating your biographical file, to which she chirped gaily, oh, you're writing my obituary. <laughs> I guess when you get to a certain age. <laughs> you talked uh, about the communication between Slater and his family, but uh, was there a break during World War I? Um, Very astute question, a heart-rending break. Um, he, Slater, um, Crime was just before Christmas, 1908. He was tried and convicted in the spring of 1909 and got out in 27. And so at the National Records in Edinburgh, there are these boxes and boxes of letters by year and the time marching along. And then, you're absolutely right, 1914 into actually 1919, nothing, nothing for five years. And he doesn't, his parents are very old by then. He doesn't even know if they're alive or dead for those five years. And then finally, there's a letter from the sister that indeed uh, the parents, I think, are still alive at that point, but not for much longer. And it is just that gut-wrenching silence to see as negative space in the archives. You know, I, I can't even imagine what it was like for him. You've mentioned that you were very touched by the correspondence between him and his family. Mm -hmm. uh, because he was a German uh, immigrant, I assume that it was in German. Were these letters translated at, at, the, at the prison or in the archives or, or not? And, and uh, the last one that you showed was in English, and it seemed very eloquent. You said he was a very poor family, and he had some kind of very, very good education because he really wrote very According to, in keeping with prison regulations, because every, every prisoner's letter had to pass the prison censors, so that meant you couldn't write in a foreign language. So indeed, Slater's English wasn't bad, but it wasn't his first language. So when he wrote to his parents, uh, he had to write them in English, and then his poor parents, who knew no English, had to find someone in their little village who could translate the letters for them. And there's one letter where his mother says, the teacher, the school teacher who had been translating your letters has moved away, and I have no one. And then the parents, uh, in the other direction, would write him in German. And when those German letters arrived in Scotland, they would have to be sent to Edinburgh to be translated into English. Then the prison censors would read them, and if they were OK, then Slater would get to see them. So it was a whole many degrees of separation. And uh, indeed, in the archives, the letters are in English in the handwritings and abilities of a variety of translators over almost 20 years. Yes? How long did it take you to determine that he was actually wrongly convicted? Was that something that was clear to you from the very beginning, or did you have to do your research to figure that out? I wouldn't have taken on the story because it would have been much less of a story. Uh, you know, what would the story have been, really? Conan Dial, Conan Dial worked 
for 20 years to free a man who turned out to have been convicted correctly. Uh, I don't think I would have been able to sell a book. Uh, that aspect of the story was known, and, and it, it, Conan Doyle himself and his subsequent biographers make it clear that he took this on. It, it was sort of a cause celeb, and very much like the work of groups like the Innocence Project today, and of course done, in his case, without DNA, without anything vaguely resembling modern forensics. It seems like he never had any doubt in his mind from the beginning that Oscar Slater was innocent, right? He, uh, he remained, Conan Doyle remained agnostic on it. He, the uh, conviction was in 1909, and Conan Doyle joined the case two or three years later. And it's clear that he made a point of doing his homework before agreeing to uh, take on the case. But once his mind was made up, and this, of course, was the man who invented you know, rational literary uh, criminological inquiry, so he was very, very quickly persuaded. As he, sa uh, he says in his correspondence, I am, I am persuaded that a terrible injustice has been done. of the first section, and now it's in different sections. And I have a hard time finding it in the morning, because I like to read it first as well, as many people do. Why is that? Uh, the Obit page floats. It's dependent on its, um, those of us of a certain age would say it's, it's a makeup issue. It's now called page design, but I much prefer to call those guys makeup men. Uh, and they come at, it's dependent on um, how many of the, how much agate, the paid death notices we sell, which are on our page or just opposite. And so all of these decisions are made by page designers uh, late in the day. And they come at 6.15 and will tell our section head, uh, you're in you know, the A book today, you're in the B book today, you're on page 26, you're on page C8 and this is how many columns you have. Uh, before my time, that, that I can't speak to. But the wonderful things come out of it when the um, makeup men come. One time he came at 6.15 and said to us, you're under the weather. And we said, no, we, we feel fine. He said, no, <laughs> here's the weather. Here's all this. You're under the weather. So. <laughs> I guess we should, it seems like it's time for us to wrap up, so that seems as good a note for us to end on as any. <laughs> Thank you to everyone. Thank you. So, thank you to Marguerite and to Ruth. It's a wonderful conversation. We're going to have a book signing now out here, as well as some refreshments. And if you're interested, our next first person is going to be on October 28th with Jamie Bernstein, who will be talking about her father. And next week, one of Marguerite's former colleagues on the 25th, Clyde Haberman, will be here leading a panel talking about the midterm elections and the Jewish vote, because it's the Center for Jewish History. So I hope that you'll come to both. Thank you.